everyone, my name is Jason Bramberger, and today I'm going to share with you some work that I've done with Nathan Coots, which we've titled Poincaré Maps for Multiscale Physics Discovery and Nonlinear Flow K Theory. You can find the associated paper for everything I'm going to talk about today published in Physica D. There's also a preprint on the archive, and you can also find the, all of the code associated with the, the paper on my GitHub at this link. Now, I want to begin by going all the way back to the 19th century and talking about the work of Gaston Floquet. Now, Floquet was interested in finding the solutions to linear, non-autonomous, time-periodic systems of ordinary differential equations, just like we have written right up here. And what's now known as Floquet's theorem is his form that he gave for the exact solution to these equations. And what you can see from this is that the solution decomposes into two major parts. The first of which, P of t, is a periodic matrix. And the second of which is the recognizable exponential term. Now, what's not immediately obvious from looking at these equations is Floquet's motivation for trying to study these things. But it turns out that when you linearize a nonlinear dynamical system around a periodic orbit, the result is exactly these types of time periodic uh, equations. And therefore, you can interpret Floquet's solution as P of t being the periodic component that flows you around the periodic orbit, and the exponential component that describes the stability of said orbit. And you can take this a little bit further, and you can say, OK, if I start here, let p flow me around, and let me ask, where do I finish after completing one period? And in this way, you can discard everything in between, and you can ask just where you started and where you ended. Now, this idea about discarding the intermediary aspects of a trajectory was taken much farther a few years later by Henri Poincaré. In particular, Poincaré was looking at very complex, nonlinear, high-dimensional systems. And what he noticed is that the solutions weren't exactly periodic, but they were recurrent. They kept coming back to regions where they started. And so what Poincaré decided to do was define a transverse to the flow, lower dimensional subspace, and simply track the intersection of said trajectories with this subspace. And the result of this is a discrete collection of iterates representing the intersection of this trajectory with the subspace. And the theoretical mapping that iterates you through successive iterates is now referred to as a Poincaré mapping. Now, the advent of using a Poincaré mapping is that it generalizes exactly what Floquet was doing. And it allows you to look at more complex structures. In particular, what it allows you to do is analyze the flow on and near uh, invariant manifolds to dynamical systems. The example that I'm showing you right here is for a torus, where you can see that we are allowing ourselves to flow around in one direction and having a transverse cut and simply tracking where we, uh, where we wind up on that cut. Now, the issue with using Poincaré mappings is that if I give you any general dynamical system, there is almost no way for you to generally come up with what the corresponding Poincaré mapping could be. And this has led myself and Nathan Coots to start thinking about some data-driven methods to discover these Poincaré mappings. In particular, we turn to the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics method, the CINDY method. And to initialize the CINDY method, you need two major components. The first component is data. So what you're going to do is you're going to simulate your system, and you're going to gather trajectories in this Poincaré section, that lower dimensional subspace. Now, once you have gathered up all the data, the second component comprises building a library of candidate functions, which can be used to build your Poincaré mapping. In particular, you operate under the assumption that your mapping can be written as the linear span of elements in your library. And with these two components, you can create a massively overdetermined linear system, 
where the unknowns are now the coefficients in this linear span. Now because this is an overdetermined system, it might not have a solution. And the question is, what is the best approximation of a solution that we can find? And we are going to follow the methods of Brunton, Proctor, and Coots, where they say that you should look for the solution that is the, the sparsest solution. That is, the one that uses the least library elements. And the way that they describe to do this is by simply taking that system and finding the least square solution. Then, defining a sparsity parameter, which I'll refer to as lambda, and combing through that least square solution and finding coefficients that are smaller in absolute value than lambda and discarding their corresponding library element. And the result of this is a smaller library. And then what you can do is you can continue to repeat this process, bootstrapping back and forth until you eventually converge to an accurate, efficient, and parsimonious description of your Poincaré mapping. Now, there are two major components to applying this method. The first of which is determining the sparsity parameter, and the second of which is determining a library. In, the, in what follows, I'm going to describe two applications of how we can see this affects your solution that come from our paper. Let's start with the sparsity parameter. I want to illustrate this with an extremely simple ODE model you can see here. It's a linear system. You can see that there's a periodic driving force being applied to it. And we are going to use our Poincaré mapping as the solution tracked after the completion of each period of the driving force. So that's just integer values of t in this case. Because this is a linear mapping, you can easily solve this. And what you can find is that you have an explicit description of the Poincaré mapping given by this simple linear map right here. Now what you can also see in the table right here are results from us applying the Cindy method to discover this mapping. What you can see from the first row in particular is that if your sparsity parameter is too large, it's going to dampen out potentially necessary terms. In our case, the constant term on the back of this Poincaré map. Similarly, if your sparsity parameter is too small, then you are going to let in far too many terms, and you get a similar result in that you arrive at a completely inaccurate mapping. But what you can see in the middle here is a Goldilocks zone. And in this case, the sparsity parameter is just right to ensure that you can discover an accurate uh, description of that Poincaré map. And in fact, the discovered mappings here are uh, equivalent to this mapping up to an error on the order of that sparsity parameter. So let's take a look at the effect that the library can have. So what we will do again is illustrate with a very, very simple system. So in this case, we'll take this simple planar uh, ordinary differential equation. You can see right beside me here is a phase diagram in the plane. And what you can see from this picture is that the origin is an unstable equilibrium point. And there is a globally attracting stable limit cycle given by the unit circle in the plane. And what we take here is the Poincaré section to be the positive x-axis. So that is, we track the values of the intersection with this positive x-axis each time it circles around. Much like the previous example, there is an exact description for the Poincaré dynamics here. And it's given by this extremely complicated mapping right here. Now the first thing that one should notice is that it is highly unlikely that anyone would include such a term in their library. And therefore, it seems unlikely that one would discover the exact Poincaré dynamics. So what we decided to do was see how well we can approximate this using, say, a library of monomial functions up to some fixed degree. And the results are plotted on the image to my right here, where you can see that I am plotting the current iterate along the horizontal axis and the next iterate along the vertical axis, so the Poincaré map. In white underneath is the true mapping I showed you on the previous slide. And in blue and red are two different Cindy mappings for different sparsity parameters. 
Now what I want you to notice is that this didn't build a Taylor expansion. It is not a completely local mapping. And that comes from the fact that both of the Cindy mappings have unstable fixed points at the origin and stable fixed points at 1 corresponding to that limit cycle. Furthermore, you can see that it very nicely fills in the gap between these fixed points, as well as goes far beyond the fixed point at 1. You can also see that the mapping is not completely global, and this should not be expected because we are, again, approximating the mapping using monomials. Now I'd like to close just by discussing some of the utilities of applying this method. Remember that I started by talking about Henri Poincaré and saying that you can use Poincaré maps to understand the flow on and near invariant manifolds. Now one of the most important types of invariant manifolds that we have are that of chaotic attractors. And so in our work, we decide to apply these methods to the chaotic Rosler system. And what we show is that you can discover accurate and parsimonious descriptions of the dynamics on the chaotic attractor thus giving you a method to forecast the dynamics of these chaotic systems into the future. Now another area that lends itself very nicely to using these Poincaré maps is that of multi-scale physics discovery. So for example, imagine you are given a signal where on the fast time scale you have approximately periodic oscillations. But as you zoom out you notice that there is a slow drift that's sort of taking place that is only apparent on very, very long time scales. Then what you can do is you can coarse grain this signal by simply looking at the values of the signal after the completion of each period of the fast scale. And then what you can do is you can learn a mapping that will iterate you along this coarse grain signal that will reveal the slow scale time dynamics to you. And you can actually take this idea of coarse graining the signal much farther to doing temporal coarse graining for long range forecasting. And what we do in the paper is we look at a spiral wave solution to a system of reaction diffusion equations. We project it onto its first two POD modes. And we coarse grain with very large time steps in time. And then what we do is we learn a mapping that iterates through this coarse-grained map, or these coarse-grained iterates. And we show that you can accurately foreca forecast the dynamics of such a spiral very, very far into the future with high accuracy.